morning, good morning, Red El Bethel. Good morning, family and friends. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. For I was glad when he said unto me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Now, God, how we thank you. For this, another chance, another opportunity that you touched us with your finger of love. God, and you provided us one more chance, one more day. Father, you blessed us with brand new mercies one more time. And for that, God, we say thank you. God, we thank you just for how you helped us, how you watched over us, how you made ways out of nowhere, how you intervened even though we, even though we didn't know you were working at the time. For that, God, we say thank you. But now, God, we pray and ask that you would forgive us for all of our unforgiven sins, God, that you would consecrate our hearts and our minds, God, that we can be focused on you, that we can hear from you, that something can be said, that we can apply to our everyday living, that our walk with you can be that much the better. Now, God, bless everyone that's here. Bless those that may be on their way. God, we invite your spirit to fall fresh in this place on today. Now have thine own way like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Listen, I don't know about you, but y'all know, already know how I feel about Sundays. Amen. It is the greatest day of the week. Listen, every day is a good day, but on Sunday is a chance for the saints of God to get to come together and fellowship on one accord, amen, and be able to tell God of how good he has been to us, amen. We're going to keep climbing. We're going to turn it over to our choir who's going to come and bless us right now.
Amen. So it's not just giving. It is going towards a scholarship. So let me make sure that that is clear and that you are aware of that. So I believe Susan McKinney asked that each member, at least each member would give, you you say five? Is that correct? At least five, at minimum five dollars. Every member to give at minimum five. But we know we can do better than that. Amen. Amen. And also, I believe she has some uh, lists, some patrons lists for those that are interested in getting some of those forms from her. Uh, is that correct? All right, she come. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. There are some things that we can do to help ourselves. And if we can, please give uh, what, uh, if you have it over and beyond. We thank God for that. If you give, we are truly uh, appreciative of that. As you know, you can see your tithe at work. Amen. Amen. The working is back in the house. Amen. And Brother Glenn is doing, just going to work over there. Amen. He, he told us he was a little rusty, but now I think the rust starting to come off a little bit. Amen. Amen. Y'all see downstairs. Y'all see the bathrooms. Y'all see this. So your tithe is at work. But there is a lot more that needs to be done. Amen. Amen. All right. Ushers, we are in your hands. Those that gave, those that had the desire to give but had it not. 
We ask this offering to be used for which it is given, which is kingdom building. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Real uh, one additional announcement. Uh, our, our leader of our men's ministry, Brother Morton, has asked them uh, for a quick meeting with all men. All men. He wants to meet with you uh, following service on today. So please, please, all men, meet with uh, Brother Morton uh, immediately following service on today. Uh, once we conclude our service. Amen. It's preaching time. Amen. Man, it is preaching time. I need Mother, and she was a widow. 
and a large crowd from that town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and he said, don't cry. Then he went up to went up and touched the beer of the uh, uh, beer they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, "Young man, I say to you, get up." The dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us. They said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. Amen. May the Lord and the blessings of readers, hearers, and most of all, the doers of his holy word. If you don't mind allowing me to use just for a thought this morning, this makes no sense. This makes sense. Have you ever been in a nonsensical situation? One of those situations where you could neither make heads or tails out of the situation. Have you been in one of those circumstances, one of those precarious predicaments? that left you scratching your head, wondering what in the world is going on. Have you ever been in that place, that moment in history where you simply said, this is too much? Have you ever been in that moment, that strange space where you wanted to ask God, what's really going on? How did I get into this predicament? How did I get to this lot in life? God, why am I here? And what are you doing? If you will be honest this morning, many of us will find ourselves or have found ourselves in a place to where you've asked yourself, even though although you're a Christian, although you saved, we wanted to know what God was up to in each of us, if we live long enough, will find ourselves in a nonsensical situation. That space that makes you scratch your head, shake your head, wring your hands, and, and make you say, what in the world is going on? And, and, and the truth be told, I must admit this morning, must admit a uh, uh, church that I'm kind of right there right now. With all of the things that have taken place in this world, from Buffalo to Uvalde to Tulsa, Oklahoma, even a family of five who lost their lives to, a, to the hands of an in escaped inmate. I'm in a place where I'm wondering what in the world is going on. And even in the hospital not too long ago, down another shooting took place and another, another stabbing even took. What is going on? Yes, even me. Being the husband and the father that I am that I want to protect my family. Yes, even me who has to watch this, the added protection of, of the profession that I have of carrying a badge and a gun. Yes, even me who stands and preaches Sunday after Sunday, teaches on Wednesdays and prays mightily for every member and friends of this church. Yes, even me. Who knows that God is still in control. Who knows that God can do anything but fail. Yes, even me find myself saying this makes no sense. We've all been a, in a place we find ourselves as you know, saying this makes no sense. As a matter of fact, I, I've been in that place more times than I even care to remember. Mm -hmm. Each of us have had some days when we woke up and the day could be going great. Only later on to find out later that something tragic has happened and now you have a shift in your day and everything. 
everything that's going on and it causes you to say this makes no sense. There are some moments in time to where you get into those spaces in life, those unique places in life, and it made no sense. Even though you saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized on your way to heaven, when you die, you still look at it and say, this makes no sense. Listen, it happens to the preacher, it happens to the deacons, to the choir members, the ushers, anybody. It happens to everybody that there's a moment that you try to figure out what's going on and nobody is exempt and your church title can't get you out of some nonsensical all right, all right. situations. Oh, yeah. There are some moments and times in, where your sanctification can't shape some nonsensical situations. There's moment in time that, and, and, and no matter how saved you think you are, no, no matter how big the Bible is that you carry around under your arm, how much church you attend, there are some moments that I have you wondering what in the world is going on. And if you are honest with yourself, you stand and say this makes no sense. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering if I'm talking to anybody in here this morning who knows, and who actually knows the meaning of a nonsensical situation. You know the feeling of a nonsensical situation. You know what it means not to be able to shake off the frustration in which you stand. You know what it means to uh, be around a uh, uh, so many people are trying to keep a good face and trying to let everybody know that you are right, but in truth be told, inside you are bound. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. The nonsensical situation. But join me if you will. Join me if you will in a little town in a remote village called Nain. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For we are not the only ones. Who knows what it means to be in a nonsensical situation? You and I are not the only ones to, who wonder why are we in this place that we find ourselves in. We are not the only ones who end up scratching our heads and shaking our heads, wondering what God has got going on in our lives. There are other people there. Then this story right here, meet me in name. this remote, obscure village in Maine, we find a mother who finds herself in a nonsensical situation. In this little town called Nain, we don't know much about it. It's only mentioned one time in the Bible, and that's right here in Luke chapter 7 that we read for your hearing today. Listen, this remote, obscure village called Nain begs our attention this morning. Because in name, there is a funeral procession that's headed outside of the city limits, that's headed to an interment where a young boy is going to be laid to rest for the final time. In oh, yeah. name, here is this funeral procession that is leaving the synagogue where the funeral has taken place. They are leaving and headed to the cemetery where they were into this body of this young boy into the ground. Listen, the eulogy has been preached. The songs have been sung. The scriptures have been read. Prayers have been prayed. Funeral directors have come and ushered the family out of the synagogue. They are headed to the interment. All that's left to do is enter the body into the cemetery, come back to the synagogue and have some chicken and some Kool-Aid. And the evening will be, now don't, come on now, don't act like y'all don't know we go back to the church and we get some chicken. Right. <laughs> that's all that's left to be done. And that's what they're headed to do. And here goes this crowd, this crowd of mourners. Can, can't you see them? They are forlorn, they're sad, their hearts are broken, there's tears in their eyes. There is a mother in the midst of this crowd and surrounding her are all those weepers, all those who, whose hearts have been broken. They are sad and now they're looking at the reality of this young boy who is now dead and headed to the cemetery. It's a rough reality. 
And anyone that has been in this family procession, oh, yeah. you know exactly how it feels. Oh, yeah. Any parent that has lost a child, you know exactly how that feels. Any mother who's had to deal with bereavement, you know exactly how that feels. This mother is heartbroken. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As are the rest of the saints. But there is something unique about her situation. For watch this, watch this. The scripture tells us, for this is not the first time that she's headed to the cemetery. If you remember what I read in those scriptures, you'll remember that she's been to the cemetery before. Bible says this, this, this is not her first time she's been before, but the text tells us, watch this, she's a widow. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So she's been to the cemetery before, and now she's headed there again. But not with her husband this time. This time she's headed there with her son. Not just her son. But watch this. It says her only yes. son. Oh, yeah. Who is now in this coffin headed to the cemetery. Church, this makes no sense. Watch this. For if you understand the customs of this time. That, that, that whenever a husband had died. It was the responsibility of the son to therefore step in and take care of his mother. And now this mother has no visible means of support because the father and now the son has died. Her only son, they both are now dead and she does not know what she's going to do. And here in the midst of this crowd, this, this crowd, this solemn crowd, this sudden, forlorn, heartbroken individuals headed from Nain out of the city gates, headed to the cemetery to enter this body and to the ground. Can't you see it? Oh, yeah. Do you see the picture? This crowd of mourners as they process out of the city gates, all sad and sudden. Look at what's going on. But watch this. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open, for they are not the only crowd making their way in this scene. For there's another crowd in the text. This crowd, this crowd is not solid. This crowd is not solemn. This crowd is not forlorn. This crowd does not seem to be heartbroken whatsoever. Look at this crowd, church, because at this crowd comes to the scene, it, 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 they, they seem to be smiles on their face. They seem to be celebrating. They, they're making their way towards Nain. And one crowd is leaving Nain all solemn and then solemn. One crowd is coming to them, smiling and celebrating. Look at these two crowds as they converge on one another. Here's one crowd who has one boy in the midst, in their midst, who's been carried out to be taken to the cemetery. And that son has lost his life. But there's another crowd. That's coming, and in the midst of that crowd is another son. And that son is not dead. Oh Lord, have mercy. No, that son is very much alive, and it seems like that crowd is smiling and celebrating because they've seen what that son has done. Lord. We pick up. We pick up in verse number eleven in Luke chapter seven. But if you back up and read the beginning of chapter seven. You will find out that son uh, has done something that is most important. That son had been sent for by a centurion. And that centurion had a soldier in his bank of soldiers and he had fallen ill almost to the point of death. And that centurion had heard that man named Jesus, that other son, was able to do something for those who were sick and at the point of death. And as a consequence of knowing what that son can do, he sent for that son, he sent for Jesus. Jesus heard about that soldier and he started making his way towards the centurion's house. And as he made his way towards the centurion's house, watch this, that centurion came out the house again. He even sent word to say, listen, don't come under my roof. For I'm not worthy. 
for you uh, just to even enter on my property and under my roof. Listen, he says, all I need you to do is speak a word. Oh, yeah. And if you speak a word, oh, yeah. I believe that my soldier will be healed. Watch this. And the Bible says as a consequence of this of his centurion's faith, Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this, such great faith, nowhere, anywhere in Israel. And from that moment on, the centurion soldier was healed. Lord have mercy. And, and, and watch this. Great crowd. There's a great crowd of folk who heard about Jesus, that other son. And what he had done. And as a consequence of hearing what Jesus had done, they started smiling. Yeah. They started celebrating. Yeah. They started following him wherever he was headed. Yeah. Listen, church, here it is. Here's two crowds. Here goes two crowds, one sullen and solemn, the other smiling and celebrating, converging against one another. One dead son, one living son. And here they come converging on one another and Jesus is about to make some sense out of nonsense. Lord have mercy. Lord, he's about to make some sense out of nonsense. Well, well, hold on, hold on. Before I get there, may I please pause parenthetically and let everybody in here at the Greater El Bethel Church know that, 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 that something, can I let you know something this morning? Because in this place right now, I'm just inclined to believe that we have one crowd and because of your situation and your circumstances you are subtle, sorrowful and you can't begin to shape the frustration that is going on in your mind because you came into the church with something that was plaguing you that would not let you go. Oh, yeah. Do you? And, and, and so much so that you haven't even been able to enjoy worship service since you've been here. You've been sitting here throughout all the music, throughout all the praise, throughout all the celebrating, and you are solemn and solemn. Oh, but there's another crowd. There's another crowd who came into this place this morning. Who sang, I can't help but to lift my hands. I can't help but to give God glory because I've seen what the Lord has done quite recently in my life. And now I, I know that he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all I can ask or think. So you've been smiling. You've been celebrating. We can't even make you be quiet because you thought about what Jesus had done in your life. And you start praising him all over again. Lord, have mercy. And may I push it just a little bit further? Because in that same living son that was in the midst of those two crowds, guess what? He's in the midst of these two crowds in here on today. And if you can't in a nonsensical situation, he showed up to make sense out of your nonsense. I don't know which crowd you in. But it doesn't matter which one you're in. Because Jesus is here. And as long as Jesus is here, he's able to turn your sorrowful situation around and give you joy, unspeakable joy, full of glory. Is there anybody in the building this morning who can testify that they know that God knows how to make sense out of my nonsense? Listen, walk with me around Luke chapter 7. In Luke chapter 7, there's these two crowds converged. The Bible says that the living son named Jesus sees this woman with tear-stained eyes. She see, she's here in the midst with a broken heart. He sees the woman with a heavy, heavy spirit. And I appreciate the fact that in the midst of all the folk who were there, Jesus saw her. Please don't miss that detail of the text. You, you just might miss your sound cue. Yeah. Please don't miss it because it will bless your life. Bless your life before you leave the sanctuary. The Bible says in the midst of all 
these folk. A large crowd following her. A large crowd following him. And he saw her. Listen, the first thing that, I, that the text teaches me this morning that I want to share with you is that Jesus is deeply affected by every one of our predicaments. If you take a note, that's your first point right there. Jesus is deeply affected by every one of our predicaments. Listen, that feel good just coming out. Lord, have mercy. He's deeply affected by every one of our predicaments in the midst of everybody that was there. He saw her. Because many of us feel, many of us feel that if we get in a crowd such as this, Many of us feel that we can slip into our pew where we always sit. If we can just slide into the space into the back of the church that nobody will be able to see our hurt. Nobody will be able to see our pain. And most of us have most of us have that church look all the time. Y'all know, most of us have that church look all the time, making everybody think that everything is all right in our world. As a matter of fact, as I, I think I've heard it before, and I heard poets say that uh, many folk wear the mask of green and lies. Many folks have mastered being churchy. Many people have mastered putting the church look on. We, we know how to say amen just at the right time. We know how to move just at the right moment. We know how to lift up our hands when everybody else is. But behind all of your shouting, behind all of your celebrating, there's somebody who can testify that on the inside I'm torn from the floor because you don't know the stuff that I had to go through as a matter of fact just to get to this place this morning but may I bless your soul may I bless you and let you know that you he sees you yeah he, he, he sees you he sees what you're going the Bible says that Jesus saw her and when he saw her, read the text. The Bible says in the NIV version, his heart went out to her. Some of you may have the King James version. It says he had compassion on her. Because not only did he see her, he sensed her pain. Beyond all that was going on, he sensed her pain. He's, his heart went out to her. He had compassion for her. This means that not only did he just feel sorry for her, the Greek word there means he literally was in the skin of another. He experienced everything that she was experiencing, everything that she was going through. All Listen, I remember growing up right here in this church, back when we used to sing hymns, and, 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 and that's before praise and worship, and, and that's when y'all remember the deacons used to line up across the front here, and, and they would do their thing and, and they would finish with devotion and after the devotion they would sing some hymns of the church and 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 and, and listen listen we, we we back then you didn't have praise and worship you actually had some folk that sung some hymns they would call it lifting a hymn and and, and one of those hymns that, that that came to my mind when I thought about that one of those hymns that that we learned way back in the day when it went a little something like this. It says, there's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Watch this. None else could heal all of our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Here's a refrain that touched me. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lonely Jesus. No, not one. And listen, I wonder if there's anybody in the field this morning who's grateful that you have a friend like Jesus. Who, who senses your pain, who feels what you feel, who goes through what you go through, who touches you. Is anybody in here who knows? 
and grateful that he senses your pain. For the one who came in this morning, who feels like you have, to, you, you have to go through this by yourself. No, you don't have to go through this by yourself. For the one who thinks they have to endure it all alone, Brother Glee. You don't have to do that by yourself. For the one who thinks that no one else can share those experiences that you have to deal with. Listen, I came to tell you, Jesus senses your pain. His heart goes out to you. He sees you. Watch this. Not only did he see you, not only does he sense her pain, but then Jesus spoke to her. Mm. Yeah, yeah he, he spoke to her. Listen, listen what he says to her. It's so beautiful. It is, it's, so, it's, so, it's so elegant. It's so nice. He says to her, Don't cry. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. Because the pathos in which he speaks is so gentle and it's such a kind word. He just says two little words. Don't cry. He said, okay, okay. Maybe you got the King James version. And the King James version, he says, we not. But we don't talk like that. We don't talk like that. He simply says, don't cry. Now, church, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But, but, but may I be quite honest with you? When I first read the text, it's like, Jesus, how you gonna tell mama not to cry? You know what she's going through. You know what she's dealing with. You know that she's headed for at least the second time to the cemetery. You know, and you gonna tell her not to cry. She's lost her husband. Now she's, she's, she's about to bury her son, has no visible means of support. Tell her not to cry. And I must admit to you, it, it does hurt every now and again. It hurts me to see people have to hear this question. It hurts me to just, just the, when those pseudo sophisticated church folk, they see people going through something. They see the tears in their eyes and have the nerve to tell them, don't cry. Each time I heard that, it make you want to look at them some kind of way. If you don't fully understand, you don't know what they're going through. You don't know the pain that they're feeling. And they, they, they're going to look and be trying to figure out how you're going to tell me how to not to cry. As a matter of fact, there are some folk who may be saved to the bone all the way to the marrow. But sometimes there are some folk that they tell them some things that they're going through, how to get over it. There are some folk, I don't know, I've heard them say, listen, I want to revert back to my pre-Christian days and tell them a piece of my mind get away from me but they don't know going through but then later on as the philosophers say I had an aha moment I had an aha moment and it, it went off and it literally reminded me that this wasn't no some regular Joe Blow that was telling her not to cry this was not just some regular fella off the street telling her not to cry. This was Jesus Christ himself. The son of the living God. And when Jesus uses phrases like this, it literally means that I want you to heighten your expectation. Because I'm about to do something in your circumstance, in your situation, that will make that I'm about to blow your mind. Say anybody in here who can testify this morning who can testify that Jesus, when Jesus says, don't cry, have faith, when Jesus says, cheer up, my brother, it literally means that I'm about to hook you up in ways that you would never imagine. It's about to blow your mind. And if nothing else, we have to learn how to walk each day with great expectation. Simply because if he's telling me not to cry, have faith, weep not. If the Lord is telling me, I need to start to perk up a little bit. I need to start to look around and say, listen, that voice was a little bit different. That voice had some power to it. And if it's telling me, I need to 
lift up and look around with great expectation. I don't know how you feel about it, but every day I wake up, I wake up with great expectations. Listen, God, I don't know what you're going to do. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I just believe because you woke me up this morning, you're going to do something phenomenal in my life. Is there anybody in here who has great expectation? You just believe that he's going to hook you up in ways that will blow your mind. Listen, listen, I, I love gospel. I love listening to it. I've been listening to it for years. Love it. And I remember an old song by the, the Clark Sisters. The Clark Sisters used to sing a song years ago. And it went a little something like this. I expect a miracle. Every day, God will make a way out of nowhere, just believe and receive it. God will perform it today. Listen, I think they got a little happy right here because they said, hey, just believe and receive it. God will perform it today. And I wonder if there's anybody in the room today who's saying, I don't care what happened in my past, I still have great expectation for my present and my future. I believe that God brought me into the sanctuary this morning to let somebody know that you can be of good cheer. You can dry your weeping eyes. You, Lord, and you're going to leave out of here better than what you came because trouble don't last. Always. Here's the text. Here's the text. He says, don't cry. I got this under control. Dry your tears. I'm about to take good care of my own. He said this, don't cry. Because Jesus is deeply affected by every one of our predicaments. But may I push it just a little bit further? Because not only does the text teach me that Jesus is deeply affected by every one of our predicaments, but secondarily, it teaches me that Jesus requires that we adjust our position. Jesus requires that we adjust our position. Now, 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 now. here comes the responsibility. Here comes a responsibility in the text because everything is not on the onus of Jesus. Sometimes Jesus requires that we do some things to participate in our own progress. Okay, 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 listen, listen. Yeah, I get it. We, you normally lose a few amens when you start talking about responsibility. So I get it. I get it. But, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. I said sometimes Jesus requires that we participate in our own progress. And here's what Jesus is saying. He says if you do what you can do. Somebody already understand the video. I'll come along and do what you can't do. No, oh, that person. Should have been a few more amens right there. Let me give it to you again. I said, he said, if you do what you can do, he says, I'll come along and do what you can't do. Lord, no, listen, if you're tired, he says, I'll open up a window and pour you out a blessing. Listen, Lord, oh, there are some things that Jesus requires that we do that we may see the miracle work and power that he has in our lives. And also, so the Bible says that after Jesus, watch this, speaks to his mother, he did something that by the Jewish standard would be reprehensible. He walks up to the coffin. He touches the coffin. And if you have the King James, it says that he touched the beard of, the, of that. He touched the beard. He touched that on which the dead boy was laid. He touched that which means there was no hope in sight. He touched that which represents termination of a situation. He laid his hands on that in which everybody thought there was no hope. He says, I know you've given up on it. But I'm going to show you that I haven't given up on it. I'm going to lay my hands on what you thought was a dead thing. And I'm going to prove to you that you, when you put a period, I'm going to come. And I wonder if anybody in here who's already given up on some situation, given up on some circumstance, given up on some person in your life, you thought there was no hope for that person. You thought that the hope was gone and God brought you in here in this church this morning to 
tell you that I'll put my hand on that which everybody else thought was dead. I still put my hand on that which you thought was dead and gone. I'll still put my hand on that which is that once I put my hand on it. Watch this. He put his hand on it. He says, once I put my hand on it, he says, I'll start talking to dead stuff. He touched the bear and then started talking to the boy. He started talking to the dead boy. Folk must think that Jesus done lost his mind. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Folk must think that he's out of his mind. But Jesus speaks to the boy yeah. and requires a responsibility yeah. of a head boy. Yeah. He says, my son, young man, get up. Yeah. Not a long conversation. Not a long discussion. Not a long discourse. He just used a few words. Yeah. Young man, Get up. Because it didn't take Jesus all day to do nothing. When Jesus makes up in his mind to do something for you, Jesus can do for you in a moment what other people can't do for you in a lifetime. And I wish you stopped depending on everybody in your circle, in your sphere of influence. And just start depending on your Savior. Because he's able to do for you in a moment. What none of them people. None of those things. Can do for you in a lifetime. Listen. He's able. He's able to heal your body. He's able to save your soul. He's able to forgive your sin. He's able to fix your family. He's able to pay your bill. He's able to give you peace. He's able to give you joy. Able to give you victory. Able to give you a new lease on life. Listen, he's able. The Bible says, he says, young man, get up. They're playing with you. It's time to turn this nonsense around. It's time to fix this situation. Your mama been crying too long. These folk been sorrowful for too long. Get on up. And that's a word for somebody in this place today. Throughout the New Testament, we, we see the Lord Jesus to adjust their position. Meet, meet him if you please at the home of Jairus. When he gets to the home of Jairus, Jairus is begging for Jesus to come to his home for his 12-year-old daughter who lay sick at the point of death. And by the time Jesus gets to Jairus' house, the 12-year-old girl is dead. So dead was she watched it that the professional mourners had already gathered inside and outside of the house. There were so many who had gathered at the house because this 12-year-old girl had lost their life weeping and wailing. And when Jesus got there, taking Peter, James, John with him, so all of these professional mourners screaming and hollering with no faith in sight, he began to watch this, put them out. Put them out the house because everybody can't hang around for your deliverance. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I said everybody can't hang around for your deliverance. There, there, there's some folk you need to go home and get on the phone, send them a text message, and get them out your life. Because they can't hang around for your deliverance. And they are retarding your progress. Everybody can't hang. Everybody can't stay around for your deliverance. God is up to something in your life. And those same folk that was around you can't hang and see where God is trying to take you. Is there anything? here who knows that I gotta press the lead on some of these folk that's in my life because they slowing down my progress. Who says when you put these folk out and then here it is he put them folk out. It was just seven people in the room Peter, James, John, the mom, the dad the baby and Jesus. And Jesus said daughter arise. That baby got up and when that baby got up Jesus said gotta give that baby something to eat. She hungry. You know she hungry. They gave her something to eat. Everybody celebrated the good things of the Lord. And isn't that what the Lord does? He, well, listen, same thing happened at the pool of Bethesda. Saw that boy who had been laying at that pool for 38 years, laying there on that mat. And Jesus 
walked up to him and said, do you want to be made whole? started complaining. He started making excuses. Started, nobody, I had nobody put me in the pool. Listen, I ain't asked you all that. Jesus said, listen, I asked if you want to be made because some folk come to the pool who ain't trying to get better. Listen, I can stay right there for just a few seconds. Some folk come to church who not even trying to get better. Some folk come to the pool we're not even trying to get to, 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 to make progress. Because listen, for everybody in here, when the Lord comes to you and asks you the question, do you want to be made whole? Listen, the first thing going to come out of your mouth is yes. And he'll tell you, right, take up your bed and get to stepping. It requires that we adjust our position. All right, listen, I've held you too long. I've held you too long. He says, get up, adjust your position because you cannot see where I'm taking you because you only focused on where you've been. You cannot see where I'm taking you because you only focus on your present predicament. He says, I want you to shift your position for if you shift your position, you will shift your gaze. The shifting of your position equates to the shifting of your perception. You will see things differently when you shift your focus on the Savior. Your gaze, your perception, your mindset begins to, begins to change. You'll start saying stuff like this. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You'll start walking around talking about a greater is he that's in me. That's he that's in the world. You'll start talking like I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves me. When you change your perception and how you're looking, you'll start to tell yourself weeping may endure for a night. But joy comes in the morning. And I'm done. I'm getting out of here. But we also have to be reminded that the works of Jesus ought to be accompanied by grace. Yes, great praise. Yes. Work of Jesus ought to be accompanied by great praise. Yes. When he's done something for you, when he's opened doors for you, when he made a way out of no way for you, somewhere in there you ought to start to get happy and be able to tell God, God for what you've done in my life. Listen, when he healed that boy, that boy got up, started talking. The Bible says that everybody was filled with awe. And they started saying, this must be. And at that moment, they started. He said, they started shouting. Listen, we can't be spectators. We got to be participators and tell God, thank you for what you've done. makes no sense. But I got a God. I got a Savior. But it makes no sense to me. I got a Savior who says my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. I got a Savior who does not make it sense who will step in and say get out. Follow me and I'll show you. Lord have mercy. The door is open. The door is open. I love this because everybody was praising God. Two crowds that came and walked. Everybody was praising God. Save folk. The unsaved folk. Everybody was praising I get it. We have moments in life that we can't figure out how to get out of. We have moments in life 
that we never even figured it out is still going on. We have moments in life that was so tough and so rough that we're still looking for a solution for. Two things. The first thing is, even though that situation came, you can look back and tell yourself God is still a keeper. The situation might not be gone, but he's kept all the way through. The second thing is, I don't even care if you do fix it, God. I might can make sense out of it. But I'm thankful that I can bow down on my knees and pray. And tell God, God, this makes no sense. But I'm coming to the person who can fix it all. The door is open. We give this privilege to you right now. That you may come saying, Lord, I want to turn it all over to you. I'm going to give it to you, and not only am I going to give it to you, I'm going to walk away. Because I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to keep moving. Because you already said, you see me. You see me. God, you see what I'm going through. I ain't going to worry. The choir already told us. Ain't no sense of worrying. Go ahead and worship. Privilege is extended to you right now.
Amen. Listen, this is has two names. This is, we're going to call him Brother Sean Torres. And he's also Uncle Sean. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes. But what he come for, truth be told, all of us can do the same. He came to say thank you. He's thankful for family, thankful for the blessings that God has bestowed upon. Now, I know it's, it's, I was growing late, but there are times, do you know that you can still get a blessing by telling God thank you? We harp on, we rest on, woe is me. This is what I'm going for. Lord, help me do this. Lord, get me out. Lord, I need you. Listen, every now and again, we ought to be able to say, Lord, thank you. It might not be what I want it to be, but God, thank you is not what it could be. Let's pray. Now, God, how we thank you for this, our brother who has come. Father, he's come to tell you thank you. God, he's an example. He's showing what we all should be doing all the time. For God, you continue to make a way out of no way, open doors that were closed. God, you continue day the day, hour after hour to protect us in this sin sick world. And God, we say thank you. He says thank you. But God, we all thank you just for blessing us in spite of. Thank you, God, for looking at our faults, supplying us with our needs. God, thank you just for your saving grace. Thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for brand new mercies each and every day. Thank you for the food. Thank you for the roof. Thank you for the cup. Thank you for everything that you. Thank you for your son who you sent who died on Calvary. For. Thank you for the resurrection. Thank you. For God, we know. We haven't done nothing that we've done by our own strength, by our own, by our own power, but because thank you for all that you've done for us day by day. In name we pray. Amen.
powerful, our comedian musicians keep playing. Ushers, we're in your hands as you come around. Please do not uh, partake just yet. We're going to do it together, uh, ushers.
Jesus' betrayal, he had gathered him and all the disciples in the upper room. And there, a feast was prepared. And as he was preparing the table and setting it, he began to ask the question. He asked the question, he said, one of you will betray me. He made the statement, one of you will betray me. And all the disciples began to murmur and they began to ask the question, Lord, is it me? Lord, is it I? Lord, is it me? Who is it, Lord? And finally Judas said, Lord, is it me? And Jesus looked at him and said, whatever you must do, go and do it quickly. And after that, he continued to set the table and bring the bread and pour the wine. And as he was doing it, he got to a point where he said, let a man examine himself. For many to eat and drink unworthily, eat and drink damnation to their own soul, discerning the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and many sleep. So with that, we want to uh, pray amongst ourselves and pray, uh, I'll pray one for another for asking God to forgive us. For we know that he'll find something that is not pleasing. And we want to make sure that we are asking forgiveness and doing things that God would have us to do according to his will. Let us pray. Now, God, how we thank you for your life, your death, your resurrection, and the celebrating of what you've done even on this Pentecost Sunday. God, we thank you for we know that you have rose up from the dead. Father, we know that you came and you have all power in your hand to bless us even though we're so undeserving. But now, God, here we are as we commemorate and do that that you called us to do. Father, we know that we are wretches undone. We are filthy rags. We are not even worthy to latch the shoe, the buckle on your shoe. But now, God, we ask that you would forgive us. For all of our unforgiven sins, clean us up as you see fit. See fit. Create within us a clean heart, God, that we can truly serve you. In Jesus' name, Amen. And after he had prayed for forgiveness, he took the bread and broke it. And as he broke it, he had given thanks. He said, "Take, eat ye all of it, for this bread represents the body which is broken for you." In the remission of sin, they did all eat together. Likewise, he took the cup and it's poured. And he said, this cup, this wine represents the blood that was shed on Calvary for the remission of sin. For as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And they did all drink together. And afterwards, they went out to hours to pray. And we don't have a mile of hours to go to, but we do have our various homes. Amen. Amen. Listen, thank you all so much for being here on today. Let me say thank you to uh, my family, uh, all those that came and fellowship with us on today. We are excited that you are in the house. Don't be no stranger. Amen. 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 Good to see our mothers here. Amen. Thank y'all for being here. Keep praying for this church and we'll keep praying for you just the same. Let us be mindful Wednesday night Bible study. I look to see y'all here uh, as we continue to dive into the word of the Lord. Amen. All right. I don't think we have, oh, I'm sorry, Brother Morton, two announcements. Brother Morton, don't forget, Brother Morton is asking that all men, all men, remain shortly after the dismissal. Uh, he has some information that he wants to share. So please, please make sure that you are here in attendance. And uh, Sister Torres is coming with an additional announcement.
Good morning to everyone. Um, we want to just take a minute. I know some of you all, we were able to reach, some we were not. But I want to first thank Miss Birdie for reaching out to Sister Naira. And, uh, and then Sister Naira reached out to me. We want to take today to just appreciate Reverend Wright, his birthday. So we want to come have you come here and have a seat. And uh, we're going to give him a. a while his uncle, our pastor, has been out. And I had spoke with Sister Wright, too, about doing it. And uh, and it was so funny, I spoke to her about it, and then Miss Birdie reached out. And so we just want to, just even if you want to just give him a hug, but we do have a nice basket for him. So uh, just come from wherever you are. We just want to thank you uh, for loving him, Miss Birdie, and all of you all for loving and accepting him. Uh, thank you so much.
but we're going to get there. So I thank you. I continue to uh, pray for you and ask that you would pray for me that God would lead uh, us to where he wants us to go. Thank y'all again so much. All right, I'm going to go before I start crying. Let's all stay. <laughs> This makes no sense. <laughs> Let us pray. Now, God, how we thank you for the eyes have seen, our ears have heard, and our hearts have felt. God, we pray as we go into the rest of this week, God, that you would be a lamp unto our feet that we may not stray from you. God, give guidance. Whisper the utterance of your words, God, that we can be obedient unto you, that we may go and do the things that you would have us to do, that someone can see you through us. God, again, we thank you for every blessing you bestowed upon us, and we pray that you continue to allow your angels to encamp all around us as we go day by day, that we can return to this place and continue to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor. Have my own way this week like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.